can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, some of the founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of. You know, John, some of the ones I think people should check out. Um, Zapier founder, Wade Foster, talks about how people were demanding ways to automate things and they keep thinking about how to add integrations. You know, this relates to chargeback. And I'll introduce John Monroe formally in a second. Pipedrive co-founder, Ermas talks about having brain surgery, getting married, moving from Estonia to the U.S. all in the same year. At the time, they had 10,000 paying customers. Since I've interviewed them, now they have over 100,000 paying customers. So they've grown quite a bit. Um, This episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses connect to their Dream 100 relationships or give to their best relationships through their podcast. Okay, so we basically help a business run and launch their podcast. And, you know, there's so many, there's content marketing, there's just, you have these relationships that you put on your platform and you profile them. There's so many positive things. I get to meet people like John and chat with them and learn about his business. Um, And it was actually, you know, if you go to Inspired Insider, my about page, the inspiration was actually from my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor. And he was in the concentration camps in Nazi Germany, but his legacy lives on because of an interview the Holocaust Foundation did with him. And you can watch that interview on my about page. Um, and so I don't just consider it, yeah, like it's amazing for a business, but I do consider it when I have people like John on or anyone on, it helps them leave a legacy and helps me leave a legacy beyond ourselves and, and what we share. So check out rise25.com. If you thought about starting a podcast, I think you should do it, period, hands down. If you have questions, email us. Um, I'm excited to introduce today's guest and a thank you to Phil Nadell at Forefront Venture Partners, uh, ForefrontVP.com. You know, he introduced me to today's guest and they invest in high growth revenue generating early stage startup uh, companies like Open Real, Chargeback, PayRange, and many more. I have John Monroe, who I'm now terming the strike force. That's like, I thought it was a Star Wars term. I was wrong. Um, he's the CEO of Chargeback and they help stop disputes before they happen. If anyone has a business and they have credit process credit cards? Uh, Well, you probably have dealt with this, especially if you're a subscription, physical goods, digital products. Um, You can start preventing, I didn't know this, you can start preventing disputes and chargeback with zero implementation or integrations. And it's the only 100% SaaS solution for internal dispute management. So you could say goodbye to outsourcing or we as internal teams, John, you know, we develop these like complicated thing processes that probably don't work as well as the automated ones. Um, they actually have real-time dispute management platforms built to empower the, ter- the internal teams with expert knowledge and automation. And they've helped companies like LendingTree, Levi's, Dick Sports, FanDuel, and many more. So, um, John, thanks for joining me. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. So for people like me who don't know what Strikeforce is, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, it, it, it's probably one of the ubiquitous terms or, or, or terms that are thrown around all the time. You know, you, you have folks, our, our traditional founders that come into an organization and, and really, you know, start it from scratch and move from there. Um, I've had a little bit more experience. Uh, I certainly have been a founder a number of times, but also have had a lot of experience coming into organizations who, you know, had already um, kind of uh, hit a little bit of their stride, were ready for the next step. Uh, we're really ready to improve their culture, their delivery, um, and some of those things along those lines. So, so you know, it's it's probably accurate that I was brought in originally as a strike force, but uh, now this is my baby, and and uh, um, I, I love uh, making improvements and change every day. At what point should a company decide to bring someone like you in to improve things? Is it oh. a certain like revenue point? Like, let's say things are going well, not things are like not going well. At what point? like a staffing or revenue, what, what should people consider? Yeah, I, I think that you, you know, along the lines of dashboarding, a lot of other, uh, you know, critical business insights that you need to measure and, and manage throughout the process. I, I think it's really important that you really analyze the, the company from uh, the, the standpoint of how are we actually doing culturally? You know, are we, 
um, actually uh, hamstringing ourselves by not being able to make as enough progress in, in a particular area. Um, and is that area actually impacting us more than we think? We might feel like we have a great product leader, we have a great um, engineering leader, we have a great sales leader, but how are they actually integrating as an organization uh, and what that looks like? And sometimes you see those well after the fact. You know, a, a great example is in COVID. You know, we don't really see or, or have as much visibility into some of the impacts that are actually occurring right now um, in our organizations, you know, um, uh, whether it's communication breakdowns and failures, you don't see those uh, until much later in the process and they're often lagging indicators. So sometimes it's gonna be something very obvious that says, oh, you know, we, we um, have, a, have a great, um, you know, creative start of the organization, but they really are um, kind of struggling with a little bit of the execution side, or they might be phenomenal you know, product folks and, and, and working through that, but they can't uh, operate the sales engine. So it really depends on, on what your organization needs and where you feel like you're thriving and struggling. Um, and sometimes that's actually put on uh, the leader in a, a specific role where it actually is the other, uh, the other side of the organization. You might feel like you have a sales problem, but you actually have a product problem might feel like you have a marketing problem and, and it's actually a finance problem, right? Um, so there's a lot of those things that, that often are there, but unfortunately there's not really a, uh, per se, a one size fits all. <laughs> Give me the formula. Everyone asks you, John, the formula. what's the silver bullet, right? The silver bullet for, you know, disputes and this. So okay. what, how do you answer that? Because I'm sure you get that a lot. Uh, yeah. So, so we get the question a lot of, you know, uh, some people are coming to the process. I'll, I'll have to start with, you know, um, disputes are a result of e-commerce success. So, so as you go through and you actually um, uh, kind of expand your e-commerce footprint, you, know, you start doing more card not present transactions. Um, obviously during COVID, we've seen just an absolute incredible increase in, in e-commerce transactions and digital goods overall. Um, and uh, you know, so, so as you're going through that process, you're trying to deal with fulfillment. You're excited because all these orders are coming and you probably can't deal with them this, this during the time. There's too much um, demand and, and other things that are really impacting you. And not till later do you I identify the fact that, wow, we have a major problem. We have this weed that's growing up on our garden, these disputes, these chargebacks. Um, and these chargebacks actually are creating an environment that uh, makes us not realize that we're actually not having as much um, uh, revenue come in from, from you know, this growth as we expected. And it can actually become such a problem where, where Visa or MasterCard or the major networks will actually shut off these merchants. So in those scenarios that, that you get at higher risk, a lot of organizations have never been in those um, higher risk scenarios, but we see dispute rates doubling, tripling, quadrupling during these times. Wow. And it's putting a lot of organizations that never really had to, to deal with this uh, in a bad spot. As a result, they sometimes come in and say, Hey, what's the silver bullet? There's got to be something I can just pay for and make this go away. Uh, and there are solutions that, that help with the process, but really it's a holistic approach. You have to approach dispute management holistically. You have to approach it from the way that you're actually interacting with your customers and, and you know, doing your customer engagement. You have to approach it from you know, the way that your payments are actually being processed and coming through, the way your refund or return policies are being managed. And all of those things oftentimes, and there's many other you know, factors in that, can oftentimes impact the uh, you know, dispute rate that you have, as well as if you've dealt with it. If you haven't dealt with it, it's like the weeds in the garden. They're just going to go crazy. They're going to go rampant. They're going to take over before you know it because you're not pulling the weeds as they um, you know, stick their heads above ground or, or as they're babies. You wait till they're large and out of control, and then it's a star thistle that stabs you every time you try to touch it, right? So what are some of the reasons for chargebacks? And we can talk about what you recommend people doing. Absolutely. So there's a couple different categories. You know, there's a huge investment in the fraud sector, um, really, that started probably 10 years ago. And their goal was to get rid of disputes. They said, hey, we're going to be able to get rid of disputes. What they forgot to mention is, A, disputes are a hypercritical, um, uh, I'd call it an asset or a benefit that, that cardholders expect. If they didn't have that protection in place, if they didn't know that they were going to be protected, if a consumer, if a uh, you know, as a consumer, they actually purchased a good or service and it wasn't as described, was never delivered to them, uh, they didn't get what they were promised. If they didn't have that protection to be able to, to use that card network to say, I'm, I need to dispute this transaction, you'd have a much much lower rate of of acceptance for you know using credit cards. And so it's a hypercritical thing that will never go away. But a lot of people put it into the category of, oh, we're trying to stop fraud. So my credit card was stolen. Somebody used it nefariously, et cetera, or we're trying to stop uh, account takeover where somebody logs into my account and utilizes you know, their, their ability within that account to actually purchase things. But what they don't realize is almost 65% of the problem is actually what we call friendly fraud. And friendly fraud is broken into a couple of categories. Hmm. It's 
you know, you don't recognize a purchase that your, your spouse made, right? You don't recognize a purchase that your child made. You see that on your, uh, on your, on your account, you're typically not going to go to that odd description that has a 1-800 number to find out what it was. I actually do. You're going to call up your bank, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You're going to call up your bank and you're going to, you're going to go through that process, you know? And so, yeah. uh, you know, there's a lot of that occurs and actually a much higher percentage than people expect. And then there, of course, are consumer disputes, especially during COVID. Was I promised that I'd be able to get my money back? You know, was there a refund policy in place that allowed that, that protected me that I expect to be able to leverage now and now I can't? How do you deal with that process? Well, I have a better relationship with my credit card company, with my Chase or, or somebody else along those lines, than I necessarily do with this particular merchant that I'm working with. So there's a lot of customer experience challenges within that uh, within that ecosystem as well. So the friendly fraud and then the, so that's where they charge back but they actually made the purchase. They just didn't realize someone made <clears throat> they, they either didn't realize they made the purchase or they are trying to actually do what's called chargeback fraud, which is you know, a consumer claiming that they didn't get it. Unfortunately, there's a lot of that now for some of these larger um, online retailers because you know, somebody bought that exercise equipment from Dick's Sporting Goods, right? And all of a sudden they lost their jobs two weeks later. Well, they didn't know they were gonna get a raise from the federal government, which was kind. But before that, you know, then they decided, oh gosh, I just can't afford this anymore. And it's a terrible story and a terrible scenario but they did purchase that good. Dick Sporting Goods delivered what they said they, they, they should. You know, they have the treadmill, they've been using it for a couple of weeks, and now they're trying to not just return it, they're actually trying to dispute the transaction. So scenarios like that that can occur that, that really, you know, put, um, you know, a lot of these uh, online merchants kind of in a, um, in, in a precarious place. And how do they, you know, preserve that, uh, that, that cardholder or that, that buyer as a, as a future, um, uh, customer, right? Because oftentimes they do want to preserve it. They just are trying to get through that, uh, you know, scenario where somebody's abusing the system. So someone comes to you, um, is it the scenario where they're just experiencing a high, high volume of this or what do, what do companies come to you? What's the biggest issue they're experiencing? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so there's um, th some thresholds that they have to manage. Um, so I, I mentioned a little bit earlier that, um, you know, if you have too high of a dispute rate, you can actually get your ability to, to process credit cards removed, right? Visa will shut you off. They'll start by finding you and kind of put you in a bad category, um, but they'll actually shut you off. So for a lot of merchants, they don't want to get anywhere near that risk point. But oftentimes what we find is that they'll come to us and they'll say, hey, I'm getting close to the 1% threshold that's been established with Visa. I want to stay away from that or, or you know, 0.8 or something along those lines. I want to stay away from that. What can I do? And so we have three or four different solutions that we can actually apply to them. Some, as you mentioned, that don't require integrations that are just automated and, and create some auto responses to, to take down the dispute rates. Um, some ability to actually refund some transactions and make it that. And then there's also the ability really to provide a better dispute response process and um, you know, to assist uh, from, that, from that standpoint. And the ancillary benefits, which are sometimes even more powerful, is we create for these merchants an ability to create a better customer experience. Can you imagine if you look at that weird, you know, you see those little 10-digit uh, descriptors that says, you know, what's this X, Y, Z, and you have no idea what that is, right? You get onto your, tran onto your um, you know, online statements um, or you uh, jump onto the web or mobile and you see this information, you don't know what that is. So you call that issuing bank and you say, hey, what is this information? They might be able to provide you with more information, but oftentimes they can't. They just say, hey, it looks like there's a 1-800 number here, call it. In our scenario, in our merchants, we actually can provide a whole bunch of additional information. It would show that jeremy.wise at rise25.com you know, made the purchase on this date at this time. Here was the product. Oh, come to find out it was actually an Xbox game and your son bought it from their account and you see that on there and you know you provide that back. So it just creates a much, much better feedback loop for the consumer and creates a much better customer experience. So they actually get increases in customers um, as a result of this um, uh, being part of the process. And then I'd say that the last um, kind of ancillary benefit is we actually have the ability to increase acceptance. Um, so the number of transactions they can accept and they can identify as not being fraud because many of these transactions are mislabeled as fraud, even though it was these consumer disputes or friendly fraud or something else. Along hmm. What are some industries that are high risk? Are there any industries you don't touch or that you consider really high risk? 
Yeah, absolutely. There's tons of industries that, that we don't touch. Um, you know, internally, we, we, we kind of refer to them as the sin industries. Uh, not to say that they're bad or that you shouldn't be, you know, a part of them or, or, or process, but, but we typically avoid the, the higher risk industries. So the industry as a whole that, that we came from or, or that it was built out of the chargebacks really focused on those high risk merchants because they were the ones at risk of getting shut off. Right. They were the ones that, at risk of losing the most money. With that said, they were, they were organizations that oftentimes were turning over every year. You'd see a different shell company pop up. And it really wasn't something that, that we were excited to deal with and, and support. So as a result, we really focus on the low risk to kind of mid-risk scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, so you have an organization that is just kind of dwindling. They're having high growth and they're, they're, they're seeing a ton of e-commerce growth, but they just are, are kind of um, bumping up against those thresholds, right? So we're not talking about people that are three or four or five times the thresholds that are acceptable to Visa or MasterCard. We're really focusing on those other merchants, those, you know, large, some of the large enterprises, the, the mid markets, you know, folks that are still high growth, right? So you can still see a ton of subscription revenue style companies um, that we support. I mean, there's a lot of those that are just experiencing high growth and there's just a lot of churn um, associated with those products and services generally. Uh, but we can actually support a lot of those. A great subscription example is, you know, you have, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll use Netflix as an example. They're not quoted. They're not, uh, they're, they're not ours, but you use them as a great example. But if you're listening, you should yeah, go you, to chargeback.com. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you go on to dispute a transaction, you know, with Netflix, right? Wouldn't that be great if the, the user information came back that said, oh, this person has actually, you know, logged in 12 times in the last, you know, three months. Uh, and actually they watched 123 hours last month. So when they, when that person uses the, the chargeback process in the ferry, it looks pretty bad. It <laughs> tries to go into it. They're like, oh, I haven't used it for six months. I tried to cancel it. Well, actually it shows your user account unless somebody else is using it. You know, you watched 136 hours of Game of Thrones last week, right? Uh, it doesn't 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 uh, show very well for you. So those type there's there's that type of uh, you know communication that can can happen in the process. But that's a great example of that is not a high risk organization. That's one that that is a legitimate business that is really kind of uh, you know driving that process forward. And again, I'm not uh, trying to trying to cast any shade on any of these organizations that are phenomenal organizations that are higher risk. But that's just not our. Well, our, our I'm here. just saying, like even a high risk, I would imagine would be like hotel and travel because that's probably a high risk. It's not, I mean, I don't know if, would that be in the sin like category yeah, or they're not in the sin category, yeah. no, but they're, they're really high risk hotel room, but not for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, those, those are just higher risk organizations. So we absolutely support those. Um, and, uh, you know, can, can, can support the hotels and, you know, certainly the travel, but, but you have to remember that those were, they have higher dispute rates, but they oftentimes still are not actually, um, hovering above those thresholds. They're still mm. usually able to stay within the industry established thresholds. They're going to be closer to the top. So they care more, uh, right up front, but, uh, but, uh, you know, they're still not at a two or three or 4% dispute rate, mm. except so, for right now during COVID. So would like online, like marijuana, I don't even, you can buy like medical marijuana online or something. What would be considered one of the high risk that like people wouldn't touch? Yeah, so you typically have some of the um, uh, what we'll call it kind of kind of nutraceutical um, style organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, there's a lot of organizations that support these uh, groups very well. We have some some other competitors that I'm happy to refer folks to um, when they come to us and, and want support there. Um, but uh, yeah, nutraceuticals. Um, sometimes it's uh, let's say the uh, porn or or you know some of the gambling sites, some other things like that mm. um, that that we wouldn't support. So. Um, there's, there's other things along those lines that really fit into the high risk categories. So I want to talk about some critical changes. Cause like we mentioned in the beginning, John, the strike force. So when you came in, what were some of the key, um, changes you implemented or directions that you kind of put in place that helped? Yeah. So in, in, in many organizations, especially startups, you know, you ask the question of when do you know that there's, you know, a change that's necessary doesn't necessarily mean, mean when you know that you, you know, need to make a major change, but, but you start seeing things across the organization that, that kind of drive you in that direction. So uh, from that standpoint, you know, one of the challenges for the organization is they had great ideas, they had wonderful customers, um, but they were trying to, trying to bite off more than they could chew, right? They were making uh, some incredible headway within the market. We're, we're doing a lot, uh, but then delivery was starting to um, uh, kind of wane, uh, and they weren't able to deliver quite as much as they wanted to. Uh, and again, you know, incredible team. I've been absolutely blessed in this role because um, I have some amazing leaders, amazing 
uh, team that uh, actually is supporting me and, and uh, you know, that I support on a daily basis, right? Um, and uh, so it's been incredible to walk, walk through that, but there really was some, uh, you know, your ability to say no is oftentimes uh, as strong as your ability to say yes. So the things you say yes to um, can get you a long ways, but if you're not saying a lot of no's along the way and you're not identifying the things you're not going to focus on, um, then, then that can put you in a, a kind of risky scenario. So early on, did the company take on some of the clients that you wouldn't take on today? Do you feel like nutraceutical companies or things like that? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and we unfortunately, um, uh, when I joined the organization and, and some of my key leaders that are with me now, um, we actually went through and, and we helped um, some, some uh, you know, great merchants that, that we just weren't going to be right to support, um, uh, help them onboard to uh, other organizations that could support them better. So, um, and, and again, it's not always just uh, straight sin industries. There's a lot of organizations that really just want that magic bullet set and forget. They don't really want to deal yeah. with the process. And that's great. And we have some great solutions for those folks as well. But sometimes, you know, when it's just too much. It's got to be a, a fit. Current, say that again. It's got to be a fit. Like from a, a, not maybe sort of like a cultural fit, because like if you're saying, well, there's no magic bullet and they're expecting a magic bullet, then there's going to be an issue on both sides. Absolutely. Yeah. We're not going to be able to live it up to their expectations and, and, and they're probably not going to be the partner that, that we need to uh, make both parties successful. Are there certain questions or things? This is, I, I love this topic, by the way, John, yeah. you know, are there certain questions or things you have in your process to make sure that you filter out those clients that are going to be a bad fit? Like what are some of the ways, because sometimes it's easy to tell and sometimes it kind of gets in that gray area. Well, if we take it, we may see an issue five or six months from now. What do we do? So what are some of the ways you filter out clients? Yeah. So a lot of this is based on workflow. You know, we have some very simple questions that we ask around, you know, what are you intending to refund? Do you want to refund every single dispute that comes in? Do you not want to refund every single dispute? You know, sometimes, and, and of course, we don't want to share too much of this, of our, of our, our magic sauce that, that makes mm -hmm. us effective. But sometimes when somebody says, I want to refund all no matter what, uh, what that tells us is the fact that they're not actually trying to address the dispute process. They're not trying to improve, you know, how they're delivering their services. They're not trying to improve their, for example, return policies or refund policies, you know, that might impact these. They don't necessarily care about, um, you know, having those uh, customers come back to them. They, they really just want the problem to go away. And so there's things along those lines that we can ask that, that um, you know, put somebody in, in particular categories. We can also ask for dispute rates. You know, if they are at a four or five percent dispute rate, they're probably not a customer for that, that we're going to be able to support. And again, to your point, um, you know, we're not going to provide the solutions and, 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 and frankly don't want to in a lot of areas. We have the ability to, but we actually don't want to, um, you know, cater to those, uh, to those organizations because it doesn't help us grow. It doesn't help our uh, the, the really strong automation features that we have in some of the, the um, uh, uh, kind of machine intelligence that, that's in place that, that we continue to grow. Uh, it doesn't actually, you know, help that process. It doesn't educate us more. It doesn't help us to, you know, improve the win rates that we have on the disputes that we do respond to. It doesn't help us to uh, increase the deflections that we can have before anybody, you know, before it even just becomes a dispute. Um, when you're asking those questions of your your issuing bank um, that the cardholder is, uh, we want to be able to add more value in that process, which actually decreases that overall. Um, so, so some of the things along those lines. John, how did you find chargeback, or how did they find um, yeah. you? Yeah, so I'm uh, I, I uh, actually uh, love working with people. Um, I, I disguise my entire career of kind of machine learning and automating um, uh, <laughs> services processes of. Uh, I, I just love people. I love interacting with and working with people. And I had worked on a couple of um, uh, remote teams uh, in Silicon Valley and, and some other areas. Um, and as a leader, uh, especially if you're the only leader who's remote, it can be really um, uh, kind of disenchanting sometimes and, and, and becomes difficult. And a lot of uh, organizations are incredible at remote, but there's also a ton that, you know, that, that really work through that. And so I just wanted to work with, uh, with it was team that was a little bit more local. Um, and as I was making a transition in my career a little bit, and I've been in, I was in legal for 17 years, um, and so uh, I was excited to apply that to some uh, additional areas. And chargeback was really a, a great fit. Um, you know, there uh, as as I think you were alluding to up front. You know, they had in 2016 really decided to make a change. They were actually part part of the managed services, um, you know, historical folks and other competitors that we still see out there. Um, and uh, as a result of that process. 
um, of changing to a SaaS application and really deciding that this could be delivered through an automated solution instead of just full, uh, you know, kind of full service um, managed services. Um, then, then they were going through a transition and it's one that I've done multiple times with multiple organizations. Talk about culture for a second. You mentioned this, when you have someone come in, especially in the executive level, what are some, you know, things you've seen across this and other organizations of how someone can go in and, and maybe assess their culture and even improve their culture? What, what have you seen works? Uh, so I, I'll, I'll say number one, it takes commitment, right? Um, uh, I myself feel like I'm failing many days of the week. I feel like I'm, I'm putting in the efforts. I'm, I'm uh, getting a lot of uh, great outcomes, um, but I'm just not addressing it from the, uh, or, or, you know, attacking the problem from the, the, from the right angle. I might not be doing it with enough empathy. I might not be doing it with, with enough, you know, kind of love for that, that individual and what they're doing. With that said, then you, you also have to very much identify folks that just are not stoked to be there. You know, if they're not excited, if they're not, um, if they have a different, uh, uh, end outcome um, for, for where you're going as an organization or where that is. And sometimes that's not clearly defined. You know, it feels like their outcome is, is aligned with you, but then you find out, well, you know, they wanna do that, but they have these other four or five criteria that they apply in the scenario. So it's really trying to, trying to work through and identify um, you know, why people are um, uh, motivated to be there and inspired to be there. And, and if I said that I uh, get it all right and I do it all right, I would be totally uh, uh, inaccurate and, and uh, misleading. But, but I think that um, that kind of focus on, on empathy really gets you a long ways and allows you to get into a position where you can start having the conversations, if the party is willing, um, to be able to, um, you know, identify some of the things that are holding them back. Identify some of those, you know, baseline assumptions that they're making about you, that they're making about the organization, that they're making about themselves, that are actually impacting their ability to have the outcomes that they want. Um, so, so really focusing on the people and doing that. But it takes a lot of vulnerability. Um, you know, there's a lot of trust that is built and broken um, throughout organizations, and you might have phenomenal trust with somebody for six months, and then all of a sudden, uh, it breaks. And sometimes you you don't know it's broken until, you know, uh, much later. Uh, again, back to kind of our lagging indicator scenarios. Um, and so once you identify those, you know, really being able to go back and, and you know, create enough uh, trust again to be able to, um, you know, rebuild the relationship. And I, I think that's kind of culture overall. Um, you know, you can't have... Uh, you can't have the ability to employ and, um, you know, and build and, and sustain great teams um, without having a great organization. Um, but, but you also can't have a great organization without having great teams. So they're, you know, very much an ecosystem that has to drive off of each other. And I've typically found that the more you focus on employees and, and creating the right environment for them, that they will bring, um, you know, bring the outcomes that, that you're hoping for and excited for and drives everything forward. Um, but that's not always, it's not always true. Once in a while, it's, uh, you know, you have constraints as an organization, especially as a VC backed organization. Um, you know, we raised money uh, through COVID with some phenomenal, um, uh, phenomenal investors, including, you know, Forefront and some of the other um, leading FinTop folks. Um, uh, and as a result, uh, as a result, if we hadn't raised, then it would have been a much different story, right? We wouldn't have had the ability to necessarily, necessarily keep operating the way we are and growing the way that we've been growing and thriving. So um, it's, it's just uh, kind of a, a very different dynamic all the time. Yeah, John, you mentioned two things, um, which I want to hit on. You mentioned empathy and vulnerability, which are huge. I remember listening to and, and having the person, the author of Never Split the Difference. And when I, when I went in to listen and read that book, I was, I mean, hostage negotiation, uh, anyone who hasn't checked it out, check it out. It's a, a FBA hostage negotiator um, and how he basically gets hostages back from terrorists. And so, and his main thing, which was the last thing from my mind was he talked about empathy, you know, in the process. And actually that's how he conducts the negotiation. Um, with empathy. And so I thought it was really interesting. I'm curious, are there any resources or books that you look at or recommend for maybe leadership or culture along these lines? Anyone that you've read or listened to or you recommend for people? Oh, man, I'd say um, I, I absolutely love, you know, Brene Brown and some of her work, um, you know, on vulnerability and empathy. Um, uh, you know, you, you find it in the oddest places. Somebody might not be either willing to or aware enough that they're actually talking about love and empathy, um, but but you oftentimes uh, find those themes throughout. So you know any 
um, sort of core leadership book that uh, that can take you take you through that. But uh, you know, even Lencioni and some of these other folks, you can really find some great resources um, in there that that yeah. you know take you into the category of and, and em- empathy can sometimes look like you know um, uh, being a being a, um, a tough leader, right? Um, and and really holding somebody accountable. It's not always just oh, I'm empathetic that you have a you know scenario that you're dealing with or that you know I, I see how this scenario would have. Um, would be impacting you. Um, the, the most difficult balance you find as a leader is when to say, I want to be empathetic for your situation, but, but you know, we, we have to find the end to that, right? We can't, um, I had a leader ask me um, uh, recently um, that was kind of asking about, you know, okay, when, well, when does that empathy end? And I said, you know, when it doesn't serve the organization and you have to decide as your organization, you know, how far that goes, right? It can't go on forever, you know? And so if you don't have enough visibility into, Hey, how long am I empathetic for that at home situation, the personal situation, the struggles that you're going through or other things like that? It's tough. Yeah. If you're not communicating, then there's no way to know. But um, so I, th- I think there's some of those, you know, communication things that can drive that as well. That's tough. Yeah. Um, John, I have, I have two last questions. First of all, thank you. Thanks for sharing um, the journey and Absolutely. some of your advice and people should check out chargeback.com. Um, great domain name. Thank An you. Amazing Thank domain you. name. Was that? We'll, we'll, we'll take it. We'll take it. Yeah. Um, I always ask since Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment maybe in the, in the business realm? And on the flip side, what's been a proud moment for you? Um, what's been like maybe a challenging point or time period where you had to kind of push through certain things first? Yeah. Um, you know, culture is always tricky. You know, when you have uh, personalities and um, uh, uh, historical times that, you know, where, where people have uh, biases that have been created based on the situation that they were historically in. And even if the situation changes, they're still going to bring those biases to the new situation. So, you know, change, obviously, you know, in, in you know, human uh, biology and, and psychology is really, you know, risk, right? And so we naturally turn on our, you know, flight uh, fight, fly, uh, flight, or, or, or flee sort of scenarios across the board when we see change. And so we can't, uh, you know, you, you uh, include change with those biases that you're naturally going to bring without even realizing it. And it creates a, a major situation that, that you have to deal with. And, and, and I will say, you know, as an organization, the organization has bring, been through a couple of, you know, major um, kind of changes uh, across the board of who are we? What are we? You know, we're a managed services company. Now we're a SaaS organization. Yeah. Um, okay, now we have, you know, one set of leadership. Now we have others. You know, we have a, a original founding team. Now we have, you know, some different leadership that is in. And so, you know, there's just so many of those things that can either positively or impact a, or negatively impact an organization. And people's ability to um, navigate through that um, in a... Um, you know, in a way that moves everything forward, moves them forward, you know, even realizing I, there's so many times where I'll come into a situation with a bias and, and I get halfway through and I, I recognize, or sometimes it's all the way through and the damage is already done. And then I step back and I'm like, why was I so frustrated? Oh gosh, hmm. well, that person was kicking off this particular fear in me um, or, or this. I, I will just share that low and high point. Um, I'll say raising funds during COVID um, had absolutely every emotion all during the same time. You know, Mm -hmm. we went through a couple of weeks when we're about three weeks into our fundraise, four weeks into our fundraise, um, and really starting to get some, some significant interest. And within about a week and a half time frame, more than half of the folks that were, you know, kind of vetting us and due diligence and and going through dropped out quickly. It was, it was kind of an overnight. It's like, bang, 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 bang. Um, They were all hitting at the same time. Uh, And I'll tell you that that was some, you know, we started some scenario planning. We started some other things saying, okay, there's a really good chance that this happens across the board. Um, and luckily, um, you know, what has happened with COVID has leaned into us. You know, we're, uh, we're going to be, um, unfortunately for a lot of merchants, but we're going to be really, really essential resources. Yeah. Um, we, we currently are. There's more online you know, purchases people. than ever. right? Exactly. Now. More online mm-hmm. purchases than ever. And more online purchases that are um, in uncontrolled environments or unstable environments. Right. Again, the fulfillment and other things like that. And so we've been really blessed and really lucky to be in the position that we are right now. 
um, and um, you know be able to navigate through that. But um, there there were a lot of uh, downtimes during that mm-hmm. uh, fundraising process. And I will say, coming out the other side, you know, joyous moment when we actually fundraised. Uh, but it, but it was so long in the coming, and there had been so many emotional moments in the middle that it almost wasn't a, a we almost couldn't celebrate when we came out the other side because it was so much of a okay exhausting. Like we've yeah. had enough time. It's exhausting. We're done. Let's go. Um, and so, so really both of those have been really special times um, for the organization. But I will say, um, if I transition that to the proudest pieces, um, I, am, I am absolutely so proud and so feel so blessed every day to work with the team that I've had. Some founders that are just absolutely incredible that I get the opportunity to work with. Um, and a leadership team that is incredible. And all the way down the entire organization, we have some folks that, you know, um, in other organizations maybe wouldn't get the respect that they get in ours. They're hypercritical to our, um, uh, you know, to our growth. They're hypercritical to our strategy. They're hypercritical to serving our customers on a daily basis, getting that hot, happy customer list to kind of go through the roof like we've been able to over the last year. Um, and, and that's probably a big thing. You know, a year ago we asked the question of, hey, you know, let's, let's look at the list of happy customers that we can quote. The sales team was asking for that. Um, and we said, oh, well, kind of these guys, kind of these guys. And uh, within a year, we've, um, we've totally flipped on its head. And more than 50% of our customers are, are quotable, referenceable. And there, and that seems like a small number. But that's just It's a tough going. industry. I mean, you're dealing with disputes. I mean, that's what you oh, deal totally. with, right? Totally. And uh, sometimes people don't even want to get in want to share the fact that they're using chargeback, right? Yeah. We have some of the biggest brands that I'm sure you know and you work with. And they've, you know, contractually obligated us not to share. Yeah, and we can't even talk. About I would, that. I would argue though, if you take it that seriously, that's something to be a proud of too, right? If you're like, we take this seriously, we want the best customer experience. I mean, Absolutely. I could see. I mean, yeah. maybe, maybe they have a different mind mindset around that. Absolutely, and, and you're right. We've seen a huge change in that, where it was kind of a negative. We're fighting against our cardholders. That was the mentality historically for our mm. chargebacks. And we're changing that to, no, we're supporting our, our, our cardholders. We're supporting our consumers. We're creating a better customer experience overall from better communication, uh, even in the dispute channels, uh, to, to making it be, feel a lot less like litigation and it feels a lot more like collaboration. Yeah. I want to thank you, John. Totally appreciate it. Everyone check out chargeback.com and uh, check it out. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Appreciate the time. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.